Thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back to the new Just Go Play podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Devnish, also known as Coach D. Each week, I'll bring some honest insights from Matt Young and Elisa Morez on what is and what can be better in the world of sports, business, and life. A little bit of background information on myself. I'm a servant leader. I'm a father. I'm a coach with over 45,000 coaching hours. I used to be a phys ed teacher. I taught at the University of Toronto in the kinesiology department. I'm an ex-athlete. I've worked with several athletes uh, on a strength conditioning basis. And what I've done with athletes and amateur athletes is basically help them become the best version of themselves. Uh, I'm fortunate to be in a field that I love what I do. And I'm honored to be working with Matt and Elisa on this project. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Get ready. Our vision basically is to be the resource for parents, coaches, and athletes in the game of life. Our mission, simply to help encourage kids and parents to enjoy sports for life. That's it. So get ready. Here we come. All right. Welcome back to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm, I'm delighted to have Elisa Moreza and Matt Young with me. My first question, Elisa, why are you here? Why are you doing this? Yeah. Good question, Daryl, obviously. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. You guys are my two favorite people to sit and talk about the world of sports and activity and what we can do better. So it made a lot of sense when I got the invitation to, to join your Just Go Play podcast that I wanted to be part of it because I love talking about this space. Um, I've worked in this space for as long as I can remember. It's all I wanted to do. Uh, when I was a kid, I was working in construction, paving roads. And, uh, and playing sports. My dad kept telling me, go to school, go to school, go to school. And there was nothing that really interested me in school. And then I found a sports science program at Douglas and uh, moved across the country, came out to that. It's the only thing I've ever really cared about. So um, I've been in sports my whole life and it's all, <laughs> all I wanna do. And the fact that now we have this platform where we can talk about it and we can talk about current issues. We can talk about future opportunities. We can talk about things that that really grind at us and what do we do about it and have that dialogue and have debates. I think this podcast has a real value in that uh, we can answer questions from people that we have in our back pocket and our, and our colleagues as well, because we don't always have this conversation, especially without any of the, the nonsense of being politically correct. I want to be able to talk to you guys openly and honestly about the landscape that we have when it comes to sport and physical activity. And uh, so that's why I want to be part of this podcast. I love it. I love it. What sport did you play? Uh, I still play. I still play, man. You guys all still play. Um, I was into ice hockey growing up. I was a typical single sport athlete. That's all I wanted to do was just play ice hockey. So I did the whole thing, did house league growing up, did rep, did all the strength conditioning camps, did the power skating, all that stuff. Uh, got to a high enough level and realized it, it just, the politics of it at the higher level really ground at me. Um, and, and women's hockey wasn't what it was today uh, when I was growing up. So I kind of got out of that, got more recreation, did more mountain biking, rock climbing, um, finding different sports, and then fell in love with martial arts. So got into kickboxing at a young age and then followed that through. And then someone told me about this jujitsu thing. And that has been my, my happy drug ever since. Uh, so still play hockey. I'm really having a hard time right now with COVID. I understand we have to be safe, but uh, I'm, missing, I'm missing getting out on the ice. And uh, jujitsu is, if, if you guys have never done it, I invite anyone they want to come to the mats because it's something that's, it's physical and it's mental uh, and it's social. And it's, it's just a beautiful sport. So I learned, don't mess with you, okay? <laughs> I can be a bodyguard, no problem. 
Mr. Matt Young, why are you here, man? Why are you here? Well, first of all, I'm here because you invited me and you were one of my biggest mentors and someone I looked up to in, in university uh, football experience. And you're someone I still look up to because you are uh, a great servant leader and, and a lot of people come to you for information. You're like the huggy bear of the, uh, of the sport training world, but still humble. So that's the first reason. Second reason is because, you know, my whole raison d'etre is to help as many people believe in themselves as possible. And, and when you talked about what the Jesco Pay podcast was all about, it seemed like that really resonated with my values. And, uh, and thirdly, having Elisa on board really resonated with me because I think people need to see themselves and the people that are talking. And a lot of podcasts um, are typically white guys who have played sports talking about their old school white guy sport experience, which isn't bad at all. Um, I mean, we need that. I'm not saying it's an and or, but I am also saying it's great to have um, diversity. It's great to have equity in a conversation so that people can get the full sides, full three sides of the conversation. And, and Elise is one of my favorite people because quite frankly, she uh, doesn't mind being outspoken. And if I'm saying something that doesn't jive, uh, then she'll be there to correct it. So that was really appealing to me. Looking forward to this. She's going to let you know. Oh yeah. Listen, Matt, first of all, guys, I'm so happy you guys are here. You know, I've had countless conversations with you guys about sport, business and life. The reason I'm here is because I want to offer value to the audience here because I know, you know, the conversations we have, the coach should be listening to this conversation. The, the parent should be listening. The, the, the guy in charge of the organization should be listening to these conversations because they come from people who've been there in the trenches, who have tons of diverse experience with, with these situations. And, and, and that's why I, I wanted this podcast to be in. And, you know, the first time we did it, you know, I got some feedback that, eh, again, as you said, Matt, it was two guys talking about the glory days. You know what I mean? There's a lot of great podcasts out there. I didn't want to just be another one on the show. I wanted to offer value that people can take and use tomorrow. Anything they learn from our podcast, they could take it and learn and, and go use it tomorrow and it can and apply it and, and it made sense. So that I, for, I'm so happy you guys did this. Um, I, I think we're going to be a huge success. Um, my family's all over me. They're like, do they want to get on? My, my kids want to get on. It's like, no, not yet. We'll get you on. But eventually right now it's all about you guys. And like I said, you guys have like, I'm going through your, your bios here and both of you guys like, it's got like a laundry list of accomplishments and things you've done. Elisa, you with the sports, coaching, uh, charities, non-for-profit and profit. Uh, I want to hear about your legacy foundation. Like, talk to me. Who does that? Who, who does kin and business? I took kin. I didn't know. I, I didn't think about business. That, that was some forward thinking. I don't know. Tell us. Share, share that. that you know, why, why, what was your thinking of at that time? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think Matt also did kin in business, did you? No, I uh, had a bachelor of a BSc, a bachelor of common sense, a BCS. Yes. Matt was like me, man. We, we were just getting the paper. We were just getting Slick. Yeah. Uh, I, needed, I needed more of the formal training when it came to the business side of things. Um, it's a great question, and it's really interesting. Uh, I went to school a little bit later in life, so I took a, a year off after high school. I did the Katimovic program, traveled around, tried to figure out what do I want to do. And a lot of the things that I saw that were happening in the world was that people weren't as active as they could be, uh, as they wanted to be. They had no ideas about what the opportunities were. And so I knew I wanted to do something about sport and physical activity. And then it was working with some, uh, some people that had their own either fitness or strength training business. And I saw this happen in multiple disciplines where whether it was a kines or a physio or a chiro or any kind of practitioner that was a craft person of their, whatever their craft was. But sometimes where their organization fell apart was the business side because they didn't have that. So they might have been the best at whatever they did, but their business failed because they didn't understand economics and marketing and advertising and sales. And that was a whole side of it that they needed to know. So I was lucky enough to have some opportunities growing up where I got to see that firsthand. 
And I knew I wanted to be excellent at my craft, but I also needed to know how to sell it, how to be a part of the financial side of it, how to be part of the, like right now, what do you do when some kind of pandemic happens? You need to pivot to still be relevant in the space. And having a business background made a lot of sense. So that's, uh, I was lucky enough to put the two together. See, I should have done that. I lost my shirt in my first gym because I was good at training, but I sucked at the business side. So I, I totally get that. Shame. I, I sucked, right? Now, Matt on the other side, he went to the School of Hard Knocks and he figured it out quite quickly. As I'm going through his business, his long list of accomplishments, top 40 under 40 in Canada, Guinness World Book record, uh, 10 marathons. He did a TEDx talk. Jesus Christ, Matt. TEDx talk. Um, you, you had your own charity. Um, dude, which one of these accomplishments are you most proud of? Yeah, all of them. Because all the accomplishments that, uh, that I've been fortunate enough to experience have required a team. And for me, that's what it's all about is the team. Twice the beauty is seen when shared. So uh, really, you know, my philosophy and, and mindset is we always have to be um, kind of moving on and, and elevating and thinking about what's next and moving towards something to better ourselves and better other people. So all of these accomplishments were great accomplishments, all unique in their own right. Um, if, for me, it's the range. And, you know, when, when you look at that book called Range and you look at the three of us on this call, like you alluded to, you know, we have the fortune of sharing from a parent's perspective because we're all parents from a coaching from a business leadership perspective, a leadership perspective, a training perspective, sports perspective, life perspective, we've really got um, a, a wide breadth of knowledge. And I think going back to your earlier conversation, that's, uh, that's important to have because people can relate to that and they want to hear from someone who actually did it, not someone who studied it and, and is hanging their shingle on being an expert at studying it in a controlled environment, someone who failed. And I know we've all had our adversity and ups and downs, but Getting back to your question, Daryl, uh, they've all been great uh, and they've all been as, as meaningful. There's not one that's more meaningful than the other. Well, I love, I love the TEDx talk. I, that, like, you know, I, I know those aren't easy to do and put all that information in, in what, 20 minutes? Um, t tell me a little bit about that and then, we'll, you know, ju just, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, grilling process. I mean, it, you know, you want to be humbled. It's, uh, it's, that, that's what really pounded those hums and haws out of me because I had to rehearse it so many times because I was a hummer and heart. I just wasn't used to or confident in the speaking environment. So we had to rehearse over and over and over again. And every time we would rehearse, the instructors would add something else. Now do this. Now you got to do this. Now you're smacking your lips. Now you're doing this. Now you're fidgeting with your hands. I'm a hand talker, so that's really tough for me. So it was a great experience overall. Uh, super humbling. It was nominated to do it and uh, really appreciated the opportunity. And uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was really interesting. Dude, you're, 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 an, inter you're an interesting guy. You know, we're, we're going to get to the, the, the franchise and IF and, and, and like how you sort of change the, the fitness industry. Um, for the better. Um, back to you, Elisa Woodsack. This legacy foundation that you're a co-founder of, give us a little bit of background on that. Um, I, I just, I, I think it's awesome what you're doing, but I, I just want, I want the audience to know about it. Yeah, thank you so much. And I appreciate having a little bit of a platform for it. So um, in jujitsu, one of my favorite people that I ever had the opportunity to meet was he, he encapsulated exactly what we're trying to build when we think about somebody who values being active, values proper nutrition, values being that camaraderie kind of person when it comes to everybody around him. Um, his name is Anthony Moore and he was just an amazing player. He wanted to be a black belt. He wanted to have competed at a high level. He also wanted to give back to the community. And uh, he, his, his journey was cut uh, short, unfortunately. It was too long. It was... Um, a freak medical thing that happened to him and uh he's no longer with us and so um some of us at the gym wanted to do something to make sure that his legacy lived on and make sure that we were able to take what his some of his goals were and move them forwards so we created this legacy foundation it's called the anthony moore legacy foundation 
And what we're trying to do with that is using martial arts, um, primarily jujitsu, because that's what he was into, but we also look at rugby. We look at, um, he was into uh, basketball. He was into hiking and mountain biking. So we look at all, all aspects, but right now we're focused on the martial arts side. And using that platform as a way to build some leadership skills and look at some mentorship opportunities with some kids that maybe haven't had the opportunity and, and want to learn some things through martial arts about themselves uh, and about the world around them and about how to be in the world around them. So this, uh, this foundation started in, in a way as well to, to break down some of the barriers because jujitsu is not a recognized sport in a lot of ways when it comes to funding. There's no provincial funding for it. It's all private business. So it's really hard to break into. So we have some scholarships where we, we work with different sponsors and, and different donors to provide scholarships to kids and the kids apply to it. Um, you know, why do you want to be part of this? And then we provide a scholarship to get them a full year of training. And then we work with the gyms that are doing the training to help make sure that they have the leadership and the mentorship opportunities that are going to help develop them not only as a jiu-jitsu player, but also as that competent, confident, motivated individual you want them to be. So that's kind of where it comes from. Awesome pause. I, I've always wanted to try jiu-jitsu, but I was always afraid to get my ass kicked. So yo, yo, hey man, everyone needs to be a little bit humbled. It's good. Kick your ass. <laughs> I would be afraid to jump in the ring with you because I'm afraid that you, you wouldn't let me up. You got to tap, right? Like UFC? Yeah, tap or snap. That's what they say. I'll be tapper. Serious business. So, but, uh, well, hold on, hold on. Now, now Daryl, Matt and I have had a lot of opportunity to talk about ourselves and some of the accomplishments that we've had. I wanted to ask you because I know like we've had a lot of conversations and I know you have all these things that I love. You're so passionate about all the things you do. So I wanted to ask you, what is, what is the most passionate thing that you have your hands in? Something, whether it's your, the businesses that you started or the sports that you coach or the kids that you work with, what, what is the most, something that just gets you up in the morning and says, I want to work at this as much as I can? Wow. I'm supposed to be asking the question, but that's an awesome question, guys. You know what? To, to date, right now, the, one of my biggest accomplishments, and, and, and I don't know if people remember this, I... I can't stop thinking, I think of this weekly, was the work I did with Run Run Revolution, where <clears throat> I worked with a, a group of 10 kids that were basically not a, non-athletic, didn't play sports, and they were assigned to run a, <clears throat> a 5K and a sprint relay in 12 weeks. And the training, the, the, the camaraderie, the building of confidence, like to this day, <clears throat> is still one of my top accomplishments in, in my life in terms of when I start thinking about it, I almost cry because I spent 12 weeks of giving with these kids. And I lived in Ottawa where, where, the, <clears throat> where the, uh, the school was. And afterwards, before it ended, they, they were like, wait a minute, what do you mean you're not going to be here next week? And it broke my, like, I was like, I'm out of here 12 weeks, gave everything I could to these kids. Um, and they grew. I watched them grow right in front of my eyes from, I say from zero to heroes and the confidence, confidence, like they're, it, it totally transformed these guys in terms of weight, self-esteem, the ability to do something that they didn't think they could do. Like that's probably to this date, like, on, on my deathbed, I'll think of that group of kids. Wow. That's like, good. That's, that's yeah. like, you know, if I could live that every day, wow. So that's, that's part of the reason I'm doing this because I saw that effect on these kids that they were, they weren't athletes, but it's, it's why we do this. It's, it's why I love sports because that's what sport did for me. It saved my life, yeah. you know? So you got me. That that that's one I can't I can't talk about that because I, I see it. Tears. I gotta fight tears when I talk about that one. Yeah, it's good. And you know I'm not allowed to cry, <laughs> or I, sh I, I shouldn't say that. Um, Matt, you're up, man. Okay, so I need I need to understand how this how how you transform the the fitness industry. Uh, with personal training, how you, you sort of changed the game 
and how that transferred over into the sports world. Like how, like, like <clears throat> when I met you before, way back in the day, you were a football player and then you, you left, you left town. And the next thing I know, you got a franchise going. I'm like, what? Matt Young? That's awesome. But tell me, take me through some steps, man. Take us through some steps. Yeah, in the last um, couple of months in school, we had to make a certain decision. Are we going to be in the physical education uh, stream or are we going to try to go and, and run our own business? And because you had introduced me to Fitness 101 with uh, our friends down at uh, Queen and Carla there, I don't know if you remember that or not, but I had a little taste of... First what, job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I had a little taste of what personal training could be. And through the experience through that, I mean, if you work for somebody, you're always going to see what's going well and what could be better. And I just thought there was so much room to be better. And especially in the personal training industry, which has zero regulation, still doesn't, low barrier to entry. It's all kind of about the celebrity trainer. So everything was all about focused on that young man or woman who had the six pack or look great, follow me, be like me, just stand beside me, you'll look like me. And I just said, you know, we have such a great uh, history of team and camaraderie why don't we just take that take those elements and put them into the business and so we graduated and said let's get to work and started with one client and a concept and that concept was really simply let's provide value let's provide value for the consumer and and that value was going to be in human development so not just looking at the physical sphere but the social emotional spiritual and intellectual spheres as well and we were able to take that concept which a lot of people would say is a kumbaya concept and create uh, great experiences for people. We didn't ask them if they wanted to lose 10 pounds or get a bigger chest or biceps. We asked them what have they always wanted to do that they, they don't think they can do or what have they always wanted to do that they have never prioritized. And then we would use the gym as a conduit and, and to achieving that self-actualization for, for lack of better words. So to give some examples of the high end of it, um, you know, we did everything from local to regional to national to international destinations and events so you would train people come and say do you think i could run 5k yeah they, we do run it with them and then they try a 10k and then they try a half marathon and then they try a marathon and they try a berlin marathon and we tack on an oktoberfest or a, ran across the sahara desert in a four-day marathon and uh, you know we did kilimanjaro machu picchu we rode across canada and we rode across peru mountain biked and we across Australia we always would take whatever people wanted to do we'd be like let's try it that wall behind me is some of the greatest uh, you know examples of some of those experiences and because I work from home I, I like to, to to look at them every day and reflect on what we did so that's what we did for the fitness industry and uh, and when I say we it was a combination of a lot of our uh, past alumni and, and, and current people that are still with us uh, great business partners great network of initial members um and let me so, so basically you took fitness and made it about personal development yeah absolutely it, it, it's like you you put uh the cheese whiz on the the celery stick so these people didn't even know what they were they were in for absolutely yeah absolutely and uh we we had success because of course when you're doing that amount of work and, and that much uh, helping people believe in themselves and be the best they can be you're going to get great stuff back and it's going to provide a lot of opportunities and it did um so your question was you know how did that transition to sport yeah when our sons became of age to get into sport we walked into the sport atmosphere and said wow we've seen this before it's all about the celebrity coach or the celebrity parent who's got the celebrity kid that's going to do x y and z and all of the experiences around that were really focused on the schedule the score and the standings they weren't focused on human development so we migrated a lot of the, the tools and tips and things that we've done in our bricks and mortar business into the sport business. And it took a long time because sport's a big animal to change. Um, but we saw a positive change and more people started to adapt to what we were saying, embrace the suggestions, you know, to the point where we found ourselves, you know, not only achieving high levels of success at the community level, but really being um, requested at the provincial, national and international level right up to the, the some of the highest Olympic federations in, in the world. So it was uh, it was just really honestly taking the, the tools and some of the tools. The, we always say the formula for success need not be reinvented. It need be implemented. 
And, and we all know that success is a system. If you follow that system, you're going to have success. Uh, but by the human nature, everyone thinks that they've got a shortcut, a better way, their way, their friend. Uh, they've got a different way of doing it. Really, it's fundamentals. And that's what we do. We really do a really good job of breaking down the fundamentals and making it fun. And making it simple, too. You, you took some complex things and, and, and made it simple for people to understand them. That's my only skill set, but I love it. I love it. So I, I this is the, we're going to go into a, a bit of a discussion, but after I just want to ask hard question, one hard question each. Lisa, uh, as a female, what hurdles did you uh, sort of encounter in the sports industry, and you know, coming up the ranks? Like, can you share a little bit of that? Like. I know, you know, I don't want to make a big thing of, hey, we've got a female on here. Come listen to our show. But I want just people to understand that it's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. It's, it's different. Can, can you share something with us? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, uh, it's a good question. Um, and I know, you know, I can't speak for every female voice out there, just like you guys can't speak for every male voice out there either. But uh, I can definitely give my, my perspective because... I think it is a bit unique from some of the other ones that might be out there. Um, it, it might have been a little bit easier for me because I've always been in male-dominated industries. I've always been more of a tomboy. I've always been more rough and tumble. So, so being in that environment where you know there's a lot of like locker room talk or it, the guys are a little more you know say what they think uh, and more than they really should. That's never really been something that I'm I'm super uncomfortable with. Uh, and it's actually made me a bit tougher because I can I can have those conversations as well. And if it's a hard conversation I need to have, you know, I can shoot the shit with these guys, but I can also tell them when they need to stop doing certain things or saying certain things, whether it's to me or to another female or to another boy or to a a, a parent or whoever it is. So um, one, I think is it's it's definitely taught me how to converse with the opposite sex. So I, I really appreciate having men and women, boys and girls. Uh, work together so not being segregated I remember my my one of our gym classes in grade seven or eight and we were separate boys over here and girls over here and I hated it and why why are we separating each other it should be you know you want to play these sports over here or those sports over there go wherever you want and we, we learn how to work together we learn how to interact together we learn how to communicate together so one thing that I think we need to always be reinforcing is how do we communicate back and forth, especially in a day and age where technology is communicating for us in a lot of ways, or we're communicating through it. How do I communicate with, you know, the opposite sex in a way that's meaningful and makes them, gets the point across. It's not confounded with all kinds of other things like, like any of this machoism or feminism or anything, you know, they're valuable concepts, but we can't let that always dominate the conversation. Sometimes we just need to speak ourselves uh, and be able to be respected and listened to for who we are. Um, and then I think the other thing that's probably been the hardest is, is being taken seriously. So how, how can I be taken seriously if I haven't had the same experiences as someone I'm trying to coach? And I remember my, my favorite memory of, of something like this was um, I was given a job of coaching, doing the strength conditioning for a group of rugby players. And these were 20-year-old, uh, roughly, rugby players. And so I go down to the field, and I'm, you know, five foot three, depending on what kind of shoes I'm wearing. But I go down to the field, I'm carrying all the gear, and I, and I know what, I'm so well prepared. I have all my plans, and I know what I'm going to do with these guys. And the first guy who comes to the field, his name is Fridge, and he's 230 pounds, and he's maybe six foot five, and he is just a massive man. He kind of looks at me and he goes, so what are you going to do for us today? And, and he said it in this kind of cocky way, like, like I have nothing to offer. And so I could have taken that and, you know, really shut down. Or I took that and I said, I'm here to show you guys how weak you are. And I'm here to help you guys get stronger. And for standing up for myself in that atmosphere, it really helped me, but I think it also showed those guys. And you're not going to get across to everybody. Like, okay. there's going to be some people, whether, whether guys or girls or whoever it is, who are just going to not take you for who you are. Um, and you got to work twice as hard sometimes. But really, it's just all about yourself. And do you feel confident in whatever atmosphere you step into? 
and it's hard to do and I've fallen down a lot of times and I've had to talk to guys like you two about how do I navigate this conversation? How do I navigate this arena? And, and you know, I've been on some, some dark roads and had to be pulled back because of it, but it's, it's probably, it's an ongoing challenge for, for everybody, not just females, but for everybody. I love it. I love it. I, again, I want the audience to get to know you guys because once we get into some hard issues, I want them to know who is delivering this talk. Uh, that's, man, I saw that when I was a teacher. I saw some of the, the females that coached the boys' teams and stuff, and they, I felt like they, they had to work twice as hard to get their respect. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Number two, you don't listen, you're going to be in an arm bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I forgot about that jiu-jitsu. That yeah. jiu-jitsu. I mean, come on. It's always there. Is that why you learned that stuff? You know what? I actually never wanted to learn jiu-jitsu because in kickboxing, going down to the mats means you've lost. Like, <laughs> down. So I was always what? like, I'm never going down to the mats. Like, I'm stand-up. That's all I cared about. And one time a buddy, he had a little setup in his garage and he was like, oh, come on, like, it'll be fun. I'll be like, let's see if you can, let's see if you can handle yourself if you get knocked down. Like, what are you going to do if you get knocked down? And that was the real aha moment for me was like, you know what, what am I going to do if I get knocked down? Like, how do I, how do I survive when someone's, again, if Fridge was, have pushed me down and he's standing over talking to me, what am I going to do? And now I know better what to do. So. I know what I would have done. I would have run. Yeah. <laughs> Not with his foot on your throat. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. I got you. Uh, Matt, this is, uh, listen, I, this is a, 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 a tough question. Um, uh, I know you, you went through some childhood abuse. I, I just want you to share a little bit with us. And I know this, this is going deep. This is going deep now. How this has shaped you and, and basically how you move and, and, and how you think. I, I, I know the story, but I just, I'd love people to, know, to hear, you know, what I know about you, man, which is it, whenever I think back of that stuff, I'm like, and, and what you've gone through and, and where you are, like you become my hero, bro. But if you if you can share a little bit, put a little bit of light on this for people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, everyone has a story, and I think we get the opportunity to to choose whether that story and whether the cards we're dealt are going to define us, or whether we're going to figure out how to play the hand we're dealt. And uh, unfortunately, I was dealt a little bit of a different hand. I was adopted. I found out uh, that on playing in the schoolyard. From uh, one of our mutual friends who told me I was adopted. I went home and said, what does adopted mean? So that was one conversation in itself. And unfortunately, there was some dysfunction in our family in, in terms of abuse. And uh, it was a, a parent who had a, um, a prescription abuse, a drug abuse. And that drug abuse significantly affected myself and my, and my sister. And so we had to navigate that. And we had to navigate that in a small town of 1,600 people, and I mean, like, small town, small town. I mean, I think you've got more Instagram followers, Daryl, than, than there were residents in that town. And so everyone knew me, everyone, everyone's business. And for whatever reason, a little bit later on in the summer, I would go darker than everybody else. So I was the nigger of that town. You, you knew something was wrong. <laughs> I knew something was wrong. And that was being chased out of parties. That was, um, you know, people looking at me sideways. That was uh, um, just, a, it was a really dark time and it was tough. It's tough to navigate. Nothing that a lot of other people haven't had to navigate. You know, the question that you're asking, how to get myself through it? It was always, that. I think that was what set was, first of all, sports, obviously. Um, I had a great physical education teacher who believed in me. And really, I look at what I'm doing now as simply carrying on his legacy. And I thank him for it annually. Um, he believed in me and he challenged me and he, and that was when you could challenge somebody and, uh, appropriately and it was super helpful and I responded well to it. Some people don't, some people do, uh, but I had respect for him because he trusted me and he showed, you know, that he was willing to trust me. But at some point I needed to trust myself. I needed to believe in myself. He could believe in me all he wanted. I had to believe in myself. Um, tough lesson to learn when you're young. So Going through all of that uh, really helped shape my perspective and, and outlook and attitude for moving forward and uh, kind of set the, set the track, the, 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 the rails on the track of let's um, help as many people 
as possible, enjoy uh, being sport for as long as possible, and, that, and create the best environments possible to steal a phrase from the uh, Iceland soccer team. But yeah, dark time. And, uh, you know, again, we got, we got a couple choices when you're faced with adversity, work, work through it, or you're, you're either going to win or you're going to lose, you're going to sink or you're going to swim. So that's why, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to warn people that when the a question is asked or a topic is there, I, I'm going to take a hard line on that topic just based on my experience, which is I'm, I'm glad you're asking that question of us. But segueing out of me um, back to you, because you are a very visible minority, and I think it's important because I've, we, we've talked a lot about this. And, and again, when you talk about the range of, of expertise and experience that's on this podcast, you know, I'd love to, we'd love to hear from you and some of the things that you had to overcome um, as being a visible minority in the hockey world. I mean, you know, now we're talking about racism in hockey. You were dealing with that in, in the, the late eighties, early nineties for crying out loud with zero support and awareness from anyone. So why don't you shed some light on that? Well, you know what? It, it, it was, it was really hard. It was one of those things, you know, and, you know, my mom was my first real coach. Uh, she believed in me before I had any belief in myself. Um, but she always said, ignore that stuff. Score a goal or, or make a play. Like, don't, don't, don't listen to those guys. That, that's how you get back at those guys. And she really taught me, don't fight back. Just do something that, that, like, that they remember you. And I was like, what? But she goes, you, you don't need to, eat. like, that, that bit of coaching, you know, forced me to be a better athlete. Um, you know, when they told me that, you know, black guys don't play hockey, you know, but my mom was like, but you're just as good as these guys. Keep going. You know, it, it was the coaches that I had along the way. And again, I know we're going to touch about, you know, the quality coaching and whatnot, but it was, it was those coaches along the way and my, and my mom that, that got me through it. And I played as long as I did in, in, in a time where there weren't many blacks playing hockey. So, we, you know, there was no support. There was no one to talk to other than your mom. You could tell the coach and the coach would be like, he, he didn't know what to do because it, it, it was just how it was. That's, that's how it was. Um, it, it affected me a, a great deal throughout the, you know, especially as I got older and there was more fighting and whatnot in the game. But, but hockey saved my life. When I, I, even though it, it caused me a lot of pain, it, 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 saved, it saved my life. I had a lot of fun. I, I, I got to attend the, one of the top hockey schools in Canada on a scholarship because of it, because of hockey. Um, so I owe a lot to hockey, and, and that's why I can't, still can't get enough of it. Um, I love watching my kids play. I love watching amateur hockey and I, and I love, um, you know, where we've come, you know what I mean? In terms of diversity in the lead, uh, you know, that stuff doesn't happen anymore. People have taken this really serious. So that, that for me, like, as you said, I, I can't tolerate that. That that's where I'm going to say something. You know what I mean? If, if, if I see that or hear that, or there's some injustice in that way or some, uh, you know, racial stuff, anything going on, I'm going to be there. Uh, that, that would probably be, you know, um, if we're at, if we're talking about hard subjects or tough, tough topics for yourself, it's, that's, that's one I, I, I would talk to, but it, it's always a tough topic to talk to kids about it, parents, because they never think their kid is, you know, that's going to happen to their kid or their kid would ever say something like that or whatnot. A lot of times their kid learned it from somewhere. I don't know where they learned it, but you know, we got to stop that. And yeah. That's a great point. And I know we're going to get, I know we're going to get to that in, in the subsequent podcast, but I guess the question I would have for both of you, at least at being a female and Dale or Daryl being a visible minority is if you could rate it one to 10, because Daryl, something you said was, you know, it doesn't happen anymore. Where do you think we are, Elisa? Where do you think we are in terms of um, being where we need to be from an equality standpoint? Just it's just your opinion. I know we're going to dive into it later. I'm looking for a I'm looking for the number. Are, are we are we are we on the low end of five? Or are we on the high end of five? And Daryl, same thing with you. 
I think it happens differently. I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say it doesn't happen anymore. I think it happens differently now. You know? Um, What's your number? In terms of that stuff still happening? Here we are. 10 being really good. One being the dark ages. Where are we? Are you talking like in our local community or around the world? Just talking in your opinion. That's hard. I think uh, like if I'm talking, if you're talking about um, acceptance when it comes to any whatever discrimination that we're looking at, whether it's race or culture or gender, uh, I think, you know, we fluctuate between a four and a six out of 10. Like, there's, what you're saying is there's still a chance. Oh, there's been huge growth. You know, I'm thinking, um, you know, I think about, uh, I just had a son and, uh, you know, I was always going back and forth thinking, you know, if, before I knew what the, the sex was going to be thinking if I had a daughter, what kind of world is she coming into? Cause I know what kind of world I came into. What kind of world is she coming into? And it's definitely better. You know, the fact that, that we can vote, you know, all of us on this call, we can vote when people who were like us, not could do, couldn't afford couldn't vote. No, can do a lot of things. So it's better. <laughs> yes. But there's still a lot of things that happen that shouldn't. Okay. And is it ever going to change? Is it ever going to be 10 out of 10? No, it's never, never. But it's going to be better than it is today because it's better than it was then. So it's going to be better for the future. I believe that. You, what's, the, what's your number? Racist. You know what? In, in my community, I'd say it's six. When I, live the G, when I leave the GTA and go to America or outside of the GTA, it's more like a four work to do that we we got we definitely got some work to do okay well we'll talk about that later i just want that's, to but that's that's where i am and, and i think I, I think you're right when you you, you know when lisa's sort of divided up it right where we are or the whole world like <laughs> you know because that that's a different conversation right i love it man guys i love this this is like real talk today was real talk like i don't know if we're going to get this deep all the time it's, it's going to be a little more fun loving, I think, but I really wanted our audience to get a feel for who we are, where we came from, our backgrounds, our experience. Like I, I got a great sense from all of you guys and, and anyone who watches this podcast, they're going to be like, damn, or listens to this podcast be like, damn, I didn't know that about Matt or Elisa. I didn't know that about Daryl. You know, I didn't know he played first. Of all, I didn't even know we played hockey. That's what they're going to say about me. <laughs> like that, they're probably going to say that. Next, first steps. Where, where do we go from here, Matt? Well, I like the fact that you decided to end each podcast on first steps because, you know, the, one of the things that I enjoy about the three of our conversations is we can always come and have these download bitch sessions, but we can't leave unless we have a solution because bitch sessions without solutions are absolutely a waste of time um, because we're not actually taking steps forward. So first steps that I would recommend based on, on the content that you've covered is uh, number one, discovering your why. So discovering your why, and that's important. What you did on this podcast is set the foundation for who, who we are and why people should listen to us. You know, we've got great range. We've got a lot of experiences and we represent a really diverse group of, of people. And I think that's important. So I would encourage the first steps for anyone is to really start getting in touch with their own why, the values, what you value, how you got there. Do you doing your own kind of informal personal inventory i think that's you know one, my key takeaway from today lisa what do you what do you, what do you think your first first steps should be here anything, uh, anything to add to that yeah obviously i mean matt's always a huge proponent of finding your why and i think that is that's absolutely critical in anything that you're going to do why are you doing it and what is going to make you want to be part of this day after day after day or week after week after week um so definitely i agree with that finding your why i also want to understand uh, for ourselves, as well as for anybody who's going to listen to this, what, what's the value we want to get out of this? So what do I want to get out of this? Because I'm coming to the table, I'm bringing something, but I'm, I also need something in return from it, because otherwise I'm going to stop coming. So what do I want in return from this that's going to help satisfy my why? And so what's the value you want to get out of this as a participant, as well as a listener? I, I think this is going to be a great resource for uh, parents, uh, of athletes, uh, coaches, um, organizations. I, I think it's gonna be a great resource. I, I think it'll be a tool that, you know, 
they can, like, as I said, they can use tomorrow. And, and, and you're right, figuring out where you are and, 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 and baselining yourself, why, why we're doing this or where we're going from here is, is the first step. And Daryl, what are the things are you going to share with the, the audience? Some of the topics that you, you're going to cover that you want to get covered? Oh, we, we got a, a laundry list of, of, of topics uh, from, you know, sports, anything to do with sports and, and, and business and life and, and, and how sports are, are basically a dress rehearsal for life. We're going to talk about organization. We're going to, we're going to talk about, you know, um, where, what's, what's the value of, of you know, quality coaching, uh, athlete development? What's the pathway? What's the pathway, coaches? How do, we, how do we communicate? How do we connect with our athletes? How do we, you know, how do we baseline people? What, what's important? Like, at the end of the day, taking these guys from the cradle to the grave. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big promoter now of the root beer league. You know, you play a bunch of sports. You know what I mean? So these are some of the topics, specialization. We're going to talk, why is this such a bad thing? Or what, what, why is it work for some people and doesn't work? So I, I got a boatload of topics and I'd love to hear from the audience if they have stuff that they want us to talk about. We will definitely take out the mailbag. <clears throat> It'll take some questions out of the mailbag. So the, just, just to start, <laughs> we, we got a ton of things to talk about. Today was just the why. Why us? Why listen to us? Why, why come here? I, I want to offer a lot of value to our audience. And I, and I think I got the right team. I totally believe in this team. Thank you guys for doing this today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks for having us. And hosting. All right. And on that note, thank you guys. Now, get out there and just go play. Just go play. <laughs>